We fixed auth, which we got wrong initially. Thank you. Uh, I know that was a huge, huge thing that, that we got wrong initially. But Have you ever wondered why even the biggest AI companies sometimes get these specs wrong? Today, we are diving into a real world example from Anthropic and what it means for you as an AI engineer. Hey everyone, welcome back. This is a project three of the MCP from Zero to Hero series. If you are new here, I highly recommend checking out project one and two first. They will give you the foundation you need for today's deep dive. At the recent AI engineer summit, Anthropic openly admitted they initially got the authentication spec wrong for the remote MCP servers. Today, we will break down what went wrong, why it matters, and what's changing in the new draft spec. Next, I will compare deployment options for remote MCP servers on AWS and GCP. I will walk you through reference architectures for both, highlighting the best practices in common pitfalls. We will zoom in on how clients and servers actually talk to each other in MCP. Expect a hands-on look at the low-level engineering details, plus a quick demo on sampling and proxy servers. Finally, I will introduce you to the latest concept from Anthropic, the MCP Gateway, announced just a couple of weeks ago. We'll discuss what it is, why it matters, and how it could change the way you build MCP integrations in the future. That's the roadmap for today. By the end of the episode, you will have a clear understanding of the latest MCP best practices, deployment strategies, and what's coming next in the ecosystem. If you find this helpful, don't forget to subscribe and check out the GitHub repo linked below for all the code and resources. Got the questions or want to share your own deployment tips? Please do drop them in the comments. Okay, let's get started. To understand where the controversy around remote MCP servers come from, let's rewind the fundamentals of MCP. Originally, MCP is designed for both local and remote hosting. In the local setup, both the MCP client and server run on the same machine, communicating via standard I.O. This works on a trust model, which means no authentication or authorization is needed because both the processes are under your control. That's why most open source MCP repos today still default to local standard I.O. setups. But there's a downside. If you want to use multiple tools like Conference, GitHub, Figma, Notion, etc., you have to spin up a separate MCP server for each one on your machine. Managing 10 different MCP servers locally quickly becomes cumbersome. To offload the compute and simplify your local environment, you might want to run MCP servers remotely. This is where things get tricky. Once the client and server are separated, say your client runs on your laptop and the server is hosted in the cloud, you now have a classic client-server architecture. This means you need proper authentication and authorization at the transport layer. Here's why this matters. When your MCP client connects to a remote server, it often needs to send sensitive credentials like a personal access token for services such as conference. If the remote MCP server is compromised or malicious, your credentials and potential confidential company data could be at risk. Security is job zero, so when you move MCP servers to remote environments, robust authentication and authorization becomes mandatory. Now, let's look at how the original MCP spec, published on 26 of March 2025, approached this problem. The Anthropic team proposed that the remote MCP server should act as both an OAuth provider, authenticating clients and issuing bearer tokens, and a resource provider, serving tools, resources, and prompts. This duo makes the MCP server much heavier, no longer just a lightweight USB hub for AI tools, but a full-fledged server with complex OAuth 2.1 responsibilities. Implementing OAuth is non-trivial. There are already specialized solutions for this, like Auth0, AWS Cognito, or Superbase Auth for Next.js stacks. Offloading authentication to these providers is often preferable to reinventing the wheel within every MCP server. Anthropic has updated the draft spec to incorporate this change. 
It introduces a clear separation between MCP server, which is the resource provider and the external authorization server. For full details, you can check out the draft spec in the link below. Now let's walk through a forcing role play to illustrate the new flow. In the role play, we have got the user and the MCP client, which is the GitHub Copilot in VS Code. We have author provider as well as the MCP server, which is the conference MCP server that we built in the previous projects. In the first thing, uh, the client will send a request without a token. It will say, can I see this conference page with a page ID 001 and I don't have a token. In response, MCP server will say, nope, show me your pass. It will reply with HTTP 401 unauthorized and say, use this guide to get your pass via the www-authenticate header. In scene number two, the client will read the guide provided by the MCP server in scene number one and come back again and say, hi, it's me again. I have read the guide. Give me your metadata at slash dot well known slash all author protected resource. This time the MCP server will reply back to say, here you go. This is the metadata that also tells you which authorization server you should talk to. After that, in scene number three, MCP clients will get the author provider's URL and start the OAuth2 auth flow with the auth provider. I'm not going to show you the full detail of the OAuth2 dance. Uh, you can find a lot of sequential diagrams on the internet already. Essentially, the MCP client will send authentication request to the auth provider. And after it went through the full authentication flow, the auth provider will send the access token to the MCP client. In scene number four, once the MCP client received the access token, it will talk to the MCP server again. This time it will say, hi, can I see this conference page with page ID 001 now? Here is my token. This time MCP server will say, cool, cool. I just validate your token. All good to go. Here's the page info. So that's the full authentication workflow. At the end, the MCP client, once it's authorized, it can retrieve the, the relevant information from the MCP server. Let's have a look at uh, how to deploy a remote MCP server on GCP following Google's official guide. GCP offers a simple, cost-effective and developer-friendly way to host the MCP servers, which is ideal for individuals and small teams. With a cloud run, you can deploy containerized MCP server with minimal setup, automatic scaling, and building authentication. Here's how the recommended GCP architecture works. Firstly, you need to store your MCP server Docker image in artifact registry. Then you deploy your MCP server as a fully managed containerized service. Cloud Run handles the scaling HTTPS and the networking for you. GCP provides two main authentication methods at this stage for securing your MCP server. The first method is IAM Invoker Permission. It uses a local Cloud Run proxy that authenticates requests with your Google account's IAM permissions. It's great for personal or small team use with no extra setup required if you have the right permissions already. The second method is OIDC ID token. It uses a service account to generate open ID connect OIDC ID tokens for authentication. This is a more flexible for automated or machine to machine access and is the recommended approach for CICD or service integrations. 
AWS offers a robust, scalable, and secure environment for running MCP servers in production, with managed services like Fargate, Lambda, Cognito, and DynamoDB. You can build a highly available and secure MCP deployment without managing the infrastructure manually. Here's how the recommended AWS architecture works. The user interacts with an MCP client, which sends the request to the cloud. All incoming traffic is routed through Amazon CloudFront and Amazon Web for web application firewall protection. The requests then are forwarded to an application load balancer inside a virtual private cloud, VPC, which directs the traffic to the appropriate backend services. Authentication and authorization are handled by a dedicated MCP author services, which integrates with Amazon Cognito for user management and authentication flows. Cognito provides OAuth 2.1 compliant authentication, user pools, and issuing the token. The user authenticates via Cognito, which returns access tokens to the client. The actual MCP servers run on AWS Fargate for containerized workloads, or AWS Lambda for serverless deployment. These servers are responsible only for serving MCP resources and tools. They do not handle authentication logic directly. DynamoDB is used for storing persistent data, such as user sessions, tokens, or application state. The architecture can also leverage Amazon ECR, container images, CloudWatch for logging and monitoring, secret manager, and parameter store for secure configuration. In this section, let's get hands-on and look at the low-level communication between MCP client and the server using the MCP inspector. First, to spin up the inspector using the command line, run mpx model context protocol slash inspector to launch the inspector UI. This will start a front end on port 6274. Next, open a new terminal and start your MCP server. Run uv run server dash dev dot pi to launch the server at localhost 8000 slash MCP for streamable HTTP connections. Once the server is up and running, copy the section token from the proxy server terminal and paste it into the inspector UI. Then click connect. If you see an error like no proxy authentication is provided, check the terminal for the correct section token from the se proxy server. The inspector UI on port 6274 connects the proxy server running on 6277. You will need to provide the correct proxy section token for authentication. When a client sends a request, it first reaches the proxy server, which then communicates with the MCP server. Once connected, you can click on list tools in the inspector to see all available tools, just like before. You will notice that the request payload follows the JSON RPC format with a method like tools slash list and no extra params. The response payload lists all tools with their names, descriptions, and input schemas. Let's try calling a tool such as get spaces and an argument 25, for example, to limit the number of spaces. The response payload will show the results as expected. This demonstrates the MCP protocol in action. To dig deeper, you can inspect the underlying HTTP communication. The MCP protocol sits on top of HTTP, so you can use the Chrome DevTools or your browser's network inspector to see the actual HTTP requests and responses. For example, you will see the client making a post request to slash MCP with a JSON RPC 2.0 payload. 
If you disconnect, a delete request is sent from the client to the proxy server. Reconnecting triggers a health check followed by an initialization post request. Before we wrap up, uh, let's briefly talk about the latest concept introduced by Anthropic uh, based on their experience building internal remote MCP servers, the MCP Gateway. MCP Gateway is designed to sit in front of all your MCP servers, acting as a unified entry point for all client connections. Instead of having every client connect directly to multiple MCP servers, each handling its own authentication, rate limiting, and observability. The gateway centralizes these responsibilities. The key roles of the MCP gateway, firstly, it's the auth management. It handles authentication and authorization for all incoming connections. So individual MCP servers can stay lightweight. It also enforces the usage limits and protects the backend resources from abuse. It also has observability, which provides a centralized logging, monitoring, and analytics for all MCP traffic. With this setup, the MCP gateway becomes the single connection point for a wide range of a client, whether it's a cloud AI, Slack bots, or any other internal tools. It routes requests to the appropriate MCP server, reducing the duplication and the streamlining management. This architecture not only simplifies operations, but also improves security and scalability by centralizing control over all MCP traffic. All right, guys, that's the end of this third episode of MCP from Zero to Hero. Hope you enjoyed it. Please click on subscribe and like to support the content. See you next time.